Hi, good morning. My name is Christina Dorvier, and I am the Branch Chief for Cybersecurity Education and Awareness at the United States Department of Homeland Security in our Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. And I sure do know that that's a mouthful, as most government titles are. So you can actually call me by my favorite title, which is Coach, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So, I'm sure many of you are familiar with things that are happening at the Department of Homeland Security and some of the work that we're doing. Of course, we're the smiling, friendly faces that you see when you first arrive at airport security. And the United States Coast Guard is also part of the department in helping protect and secure our waterways and borders, and the Secret Service helping protect our president. So you can see there's a pretty good theme of basically what we're trying to do is help protect the country and make sure that you are safe and secure. There is one area that you might not be familiar with that we also are working to help make sure that you're safe and secure. And that's in protecting our cybersecurity networks and specifically the .gov. So the government networks that we're using to conduct our national business. And any address basically that ends in .gov, whitehouse.gov, dhs.gov. But, as I mentioned, coach is really my favorite title, and let me tell you why. I have had the opportunity and truly the honor of being a swim coach here in, in Arlington for the last 10 years. I'm the head swim coach at Washington Lee High School and also at the Fort Myer Officers Club, and for the last few years at Williamsburg Middle School. Being able to interact with kids on a daily basis has been awesome. It's also a really, given me a really unique perspective to see what they're up to. Most of the time I'm yelling at them to get in the pool even when it's cold, or swim faster and do their best. But it's also given me an opportunity to really see and understand what they're doing online. And you would be surprised. <laughs> they're doing a lot and it's not necessarily what you think. So what are kids doing online? Well, it's not just homework and it's not just texting their friends. They are on every social media platform that is available to them. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vine, you name it. And you can also attribute to that to why your data plans might be exploding. But kids also have a different idea of what privacy means. They're willing to share basically anything online. And they're willing to do that because they spend so much time online. On average, a kid spends about eight hours a day online. So if they're sleeping for eight hours, and they're in school for eight hours, really every other opportunity they have that they're awake, they're connected, and they're online. So what are some things that you can do, actually, to, do help, talk, to help educate them about what they can do to be safe? First up, talk with your kids. Let me give you a little story that you might want to share with them. Currently, the United States Library of Congress is archiving every single tweet. Did you know that? So it's a cool social media experiment, but it also could have lasting impacts into your future or your kid's future. And let me give you a story about how that actually happened recently. There was a student in high school who was excelling in basketball. He was doing great things, and so many colleges and universities were looking at him to be a part of their athletic programs. Well, ultimately, he was offered a scholarship, $140,000 to be exact for a four-year education. How great is that? The school decided, we're going to take a look at what this kid is doing online. What has he been tweeting? What does his social media profiles look like? And after exploring what he was willing to share online, kind of that overstepping of boundaries and privacy, they ultimately decided that they would revoke his scholarship. So that 140-character tweet is really not worth $140,000 in college education. But that's what's happening these days. So it is critically important that you talk to your kids, just as you talk to them about not smoking or doing, looking both ways before they cross the street. Please make sure that you're adding a conversation point in there about what they're doing online. Also, make sure you lock down your privacy settings, your kids' privacy settings in particular. <clears throat> there are many cases where popularity is determined by how many Instagram likes you have on a photo. Who was the first like? Who was the first person to comment? or how many retweets you have. But that can also be a concern. Strangers are seeing that information potentially, not just friends and family. So please make sure that those settings are on lockdown. <clears throat> and finally, there should really be no expectation of privacy in your house if you have a kid. And those kids should know that you're seeing everything that they're posting. So friend them. Do that right now if you aren't already. On Snapchat, even though it's a little bit weird and most adults don't understand it, on Vine, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, you name it, make sure that you're friends with your kids on those sites. But it's not just kids who are having problem with what they're doing online these days, right? It's everybody. Adults, you name it. <clears throat> and Probably one of the most common ways that adults are seeing their risk online is through the most traditional way of accessing people's information, and that's phishing, a phishing email. 
I'm sure you're very familiar with the funny ones, right? The Prince of Nigeria has suddenly gotten in touch with you, and if you click this link and send millions of dollars, you'll be rewarded in triple. We all know that that's pretty untrue. But phishing has actually become more and more sophisticated. Emails look like they're coming from reputable establishments, your bank, or even your friends and family. So the number one rule here is, when in doubt, throw it out. Do not click on a link, do not open an attachment if you aren't 100% certain who that email is from. It really is one of the most basic tips, but it is still one that is a problem today and people are still willing to trust that that email is coming from their bank, a reputable organization, or a friend and family member. And on that note, most reputable organizations, again, your bank or an e-commerce site, are no longer sending emails asking you to open an attachment or click on a link for this exact reason. But the internet really is more than just emails. We're doing so much more online. People's refrigerators are connected to the internet now. Your car could be connected to the internet. You're accessing it no matter where you are, maybe right here in this room, somewhere on the go, on Wi-Fi on an airplane. But truly, it is constantly part of what we are doing in our everyday lives. Let's actually do a little pop quiz. How many of you think you check your phone 50 times a day? Raise your hand. How many 100 times a day? 150? Anybody think they're over 200 times a day? You crazy kids, you. <laughs> well, truthfully, uh, the average person checks their phone about 150 times a day. That's about every six and a half minutes, which I think we'll all do. Let's all quick check. Six and a half minutes in? Okay, great. Um, but that just goes to show, truly, how much we really are online. <clears throat> and there's ways we're using the internet for fun. I'm sure you're all so familiar with this. Hashtag the dress. This dress is a prime example of just truly how connected we are and how those connections are moving at light speed. It's blue, it's black, anyone? It's white, it's gold, it's white and gold for me. <laughs> um, but this dress originated in Scotland and within hours was on CNN and by the end of the day was being discussed in the White House briefing room as breaking news. <clears throat> and never mind what it did for the manufacturer, 350% sales increase overnight just from one individual who posted this picture while they were out shopping. Now, even though this is a really fun example of how connected we are and how things are truly moving at light speed, there's also other things that are coming out of this constant connectedness. I know everybody remembers the Boston bombing tragedy. And as horrible as that time was, what it really showed us was that we're not receiving news, breaking news, in traditional ways. Twitter was actually the way that we all around the country learned about the Boston bombing. It wasn't at, in your nightly news segment, and it didn't take hours to reach you in your homes. It's also a way that family members were able to communicate with each other and let people know that they were safe and where they were. And this has really transformed the way that we share information and receive information. And more than that, it has again brought this constant connectedness to every fiber of what we're doing. Another aspect that has really gotten online, if you will, and is constantly connected, is our nation's critical infrastructure. While typically the role, to, the role of the government and the private sector is to help make sure that our systems, our nation's critical infrastructure, are running smoothly, there's also roles for other folks to play. But specifically, what does critical infrastructure mean to you? The bridges that you drive on, the highways? It actually is the hot water that you had this morning when you got out of your bed and it was 60 degrees and you needed a hot shower. That was because our critical infrastructures were safe, critical infrastructure networks were safe and secure overnight. Same with your coffee this morning. So again, the government and private sector have the major role here in ensuring that these systems are running smoothly and are safe and secure. But it can't just be the government and it can't just be private sector who's responsible for what we're doing online and making sure that the nation is safe. We all have a role to play. Every single person in this room, every single person in this country. <clears throat> and why not every person in Arlington? Why not start here? So speaking of Arlington, since we're here, I love Arlington. I have lived here for the last 10 years. It's been such a great ride living here. There's so many unique opportunities that we have access to. We're so close to DC and get all the wonderful experiences of being near the city, but we really still have that small town feel. I love all the great restaurants, I love that it's walkable, <clears throat> and I certainly love that we have some of the best schools in the country. 
Um, also, there's some great things happening in Arlington related to the tech scene. Right here in Roslyn, we have a booming tech startup scene. Who knew? And also, your local county is doing something for you in this realm. The Department of Technology actually created the Connect Arlington program and is running a high-speed fiber optic cable between county buildings and school buildings to ensure that there's digital services for everyone for years to come. But even longtime Arlington residents might not know something. Also located right here is the epicenter of federal cybersecurity efforts. Our 24 by 7 National Cybersecurity Communication Integration Center, and again, in true government form, we have an acronym, don't worry, it's called the NKIC, is located in Boston. And they're doing such great work there that the president actually stopped by a couple months ago to commend everybody on what they're doing to help make sure that the cyber networks, the .gov, is running smoothly and is safe and secure. But again, it's not just the government. It's not just the private sector, the businesses and companies that use their applications and their software. We're really all online together. And everybody has a responsibility to understand what the risks are and what they can do to protect themselves. So, speaking of protecting yourself, just as you protect your house, you lock your door, I hope, when you go to bed, as great as Arlington is, I hope that that's still a practice that's happening. And, of course, you don't hand the keys to your car to your 16-year-old and say, have a great day, get on 66, without extensive driver's education training. A whole year in the car with you, parents, sorry about that year of your life. And, of course, driver's ed classes, a test they have to take, all of these experiences in education to make sure that they're prepared. But yet, we don't always lock our digital doors. We're not locking our phones, necessarily, because it's an inconvenience. Or we're giving a five-year-old an iPad and letting them take care of themselves for a few hours with no instruction, education, or training on what maybe they need to know or watch out for, even at that age, in what they're doing online. So a couple kind of big ticket items of what you should be aware of. <clears throat> when you're using Wi-Fi, please make sure you're doing that with care. If you're at home, ensure that your Wi-Fi is password protected. If you're out in public, and you want to really, truly get on that Starbucks Wi-Fi so that your data plan doesn't explode, I get it, I do. Just make sure that you're not doing something that's critically important to you, like checking your bank account or maybe even logging into your email. <clears throat> make sure that you're updating software and your operating systems. This is the number one way that businesses work to protect you and ensure that you're a repeat customer with their products. It's something that not a lot of people think about doing, but it really is one of the most basic things you can do to make sure that your systems and your applications are secure. And finally, use strong passwords. I know that this is one you hear all the time. And sites nowadays are even requiring that you have a strong password. And putting your cat's name out on your internet site, wishing your best friend a happy birthday, telling people you're going on vacation for two weeks and your home will be, then be vacant, that might not seem like anything important at the time, but it's the compilation of all of those pieces of data together that actually create an online picture of who you are, what you do, what you like, and what somebody could use to potentially know more about you without your knowledge. And it's just one person with the weak password made up of their cat's name and birthday that can cause damage or allow for millions and millions of people's information to ha be given out to others. We saw that recently with the OPM breach and the Target breach. It was one person who ha made a mistake, had the bad password, clicked on the link, whatever it might be, that allowed for all those millions of people to be impacted. So, what do we do here? Well, number one, stop and think. Really, truly, stop and think before you share online. If you wouldn't be willing to walk up to a perfect stranger on the street corner in Clarendon and say, hi, my name's Christina. I'm a swim coach at Washington Lee High School. I live in South Arlington, and I went to college at George Mason and all of these wonderful things. Don't put that online. I wouldn't walk up to a perfect stranger and say that. <clears throat> Second, a really big tip that I use, especially in online shopping, because people ask a lot about that, is that you should have a separate credit card for your online shopping accounts, <clears throat> and it shouldn't be tied to your bank account. This offers you a little bit of extra protection, and if those sites were to be compromised, somebody wouldn't have direct access to your money. So, I'm sure after all of this information I've given you, you're saying, what the heck, where do I even start? Yeah, right, my kids are never gonna listen to me. What do I even do? Well, guess what? I am the government, and I'm here to help. 
and I mean that in all sincerity, <laughs> in 2009, the <clears throat> president did a review of what was happening across the federal cyberspace. And one of the biggest gaps he saw and identified was that we didn't have an education campaign. We had no education, in fact, going out about cybersecurity. So we were actually tasked at the Department of Homeland Security in partnership with industry like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, you name it, and nonprofit organizations across the country to create a Smokey the Bear-like campaign for cyber safety. And so we did just that. So of course, there's resources free to you, compliments of your tax dollars, uh, that you can use to learn about what you can do to be safe online. And October is actually a great, great time to take, start doing that. October is actually National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I bet you didn't know that. It also is uh, National Cheese Month, in case you were wondering. But back to National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I'm really excited to be here today because this is kind of how we're launching a National Cybersecurity Awareness Month here in Virginia and in Arlington specifically. And each year, the Awareness Month is designated by presidential proclamation. So it really is a great time, if you haven't thought about it before, to get information about what you can do to be safe online. So, Everyone has an opportunity, as we said. The individual here really has the power. It takes just one person to make the mistake or one person to make the right choice. Of course, we're not gonna throw out our keyboards. We're not gonna go back to writing our term papers on typewriter. But we have the opportunity to really be good online citizens. And let me just leave you with one last thought of a way you can do that. <clears throat> the internet is so connected. Everything we're doing is intertwined. It's not as easy as it used to be to separate things out and say, this is just my home network, or this is just what I'm doing on my phone. All of those pieces of the puzzle are being brought together. <clears throat> and you have an opportunity to impact that at a, in a big way and on a big scale. One of the ways that I choose to give back is by being a federal employee, and I truly mean that. It's really how I feel like I'm helping make our country better and safer. I'm also a swim coach, as I mentioned. You can ask any one of my kids, even these crazy ones in the picture, that I go above and beyond and I'm willing to do anything to make sure that those kids have the best experience and are having fun. My husband was in the Marine Corps and that was his way of giving back to the country. So no matter what else you're doing, no matter how else you're involved in the community or helping the country, there is one thing that you can do today, right now, that will impact not only the people in this room, not only your immediate family and the community here of Arlington, but the country as a whole. And that is doing your part, giving back in the online community, and determining what the etiquette will be and what the culture is that we want to create and how we use the internet. So if I can leave you with one last thought, it is do your part and really truly be that good online citizen that I know you can be. Thank you. Thank you.